uh, physicists playing around in their laboratories were making these glass bell jars so they could uh, suck the air out of them and play around with a vacuum and things like this. And the market gardeners saw them and they thought, oh wow, this is a great deal. We can put these all over the field and use them as uh, uh, little uh, protectors to grow crops in the winter. And this is the way you invented them. And you can imagine some of these farms had 3,000 glass bell jars and other explosions. So we're talking about a lot of hand labor in the old days to do out of season production. And then you could roll mats, rolling straw mats out over them at night uh, to keep them a, a little warmer. Uh, this was being done around Paris. Paris is about zone eight, like down in Georgia in the winter. So it wasn't that hard, but uh, uh, they did even better than this as time went on. Um, all the transportation back in those days was horse and buggy, and of course in the city, there was a lot of horses in the stables, and there was a lot of horses in the And the farmers would collect that every day, uh, fill their wagon with manure after they delivered their vegetables, take it back to the farm, and if you've ever composted horse manure, it heats up wonderfully. So you put a thick layer of horse manure, uh, and you put some soil on top of that and put uh, gold francs on top of that. And these guys were producing cucumbers in May, almonds in May and June. Uh, it was pretty amazing. But this is simple technology, totally uh, uh, going to go on forever because it wasn't using any uh, uh, non-renewables. But the thing I love best, these guys were not wasting any space in their operations. They only had 10-foot paths between all those beds. You couldn't get in there with a wheelbarrow, so they had these special baskets. You see that thing blowing up over the head. And you filled those with manure, and then you went in and you were the human dump truck. You just bent over your waist, all that stuff combed out over your head. <laughs> <laughs> the farmers have always been tough. When I was first over there in 74, a lot of this stuff was still going on, production in, uh, in old frames like this. Uh, they were still putting straw mats uh, on in some of these operations. And the ones I saw that I liked best were in Holland. Uh, these were just single panes of glass in a uh, wooden frame. And uh, I went to work on this farm for four days just to find out what was going on. And it was amazing uh, what could be produced. Of course, they were in a Mildly, milder climate than we were. But the farm that most impressed me was just south of Paris. It was part of that tradition that existed in Paris in the, uh, uh, through most of the second half of the uh, uh, 19th century and on into the early 20th century. This was Louis Saudier's place, and you can see a lot of the old glass coal frames are, uh, are still there. This is, uh, uh, this is in the, uh, the 70s and, and 80s he was still doing it. Uh, and all ended, and uh, this is where he grew all of his seedlings that he transplanted out. Just an amazingly efficient operation. And also beautifully done. It was not a, a wasted inch. This is his daughter and one of their workers punching radishes. They had little uh, uh, holders for uh, rubber bands on their belts. They got the little pants on, more quite long. And I always thought this looked like some sort of impressionist painting. It was so beautiful of uh, the radish punches behind him on the soil. But the neatest thing, and this was true in Paris, they didn't want to waste any space on the roads in there to deliver compost. And so there were these little railroad tracks that ran around the place. And Louis Xavier's irrigation system ran on this. It was pulled along by the pressure of the uh, hosed water going through a, a gear on the bottom of the wagon. And it spread water as it slowly inched its way down the track. And he had, uh, he had carts that he could put uh, is produced in or take the compost down. Just amazingly efficient operation. But the thing that most intrigued me was the way he was planting. This, these are spring onions. Uh, they're going to turn into onions next summer. They were planted in uh, uh, early September, and so was the mosh or corn salad, that little green salad crop in between them, which is just about at harvest stage now. You harvested that with a pack on your back with your feet in between the onions and went along cutting the marsh ahead of you, just tossing them behind you with a pack on your back. And uh, this was the level of intense production that was being done in all of these uh, French farms, uh, vegetable farms for years, for out-of-season production, because this 
pictures that was taken at the end of November as to what was going on. Well, so I came home and I built my first greenhouse. And this that little house in the background, that was the first house I built on our farm. It cost me $1,000 in 1968. Um, we didn't have any electricity, so we didn't have any running water. And how do you build a greenhouse if you can't irrigate it? But that wasn't going to stop me. So we set it up so we could roll the plastic back off of it whenever it was going to rain. And then, so it was a, we, you know, about to rain, we'd roll it off, the rain would rain, and we'd roll the plastic back on. That was the best we could do, but, you know, in desperate times, desperate measures are called for. And I built a lot of cold frames, and we got uh, pretty good at producing in them. Uh, this were, these were neat techniques. We could uh, cover beds of carrots with them and be harvesting carrots in the middle of the winter, and these were incredibly sweet carrots. Um, and so we would, you know, rake these things uh, rake out the soil in there. We made some of them double like we'd seen in, uh, in Holland and uh, plant them up to, to different crops. Sometimes we'd, uh, we'd put carrots in there and uh, then put straw in to protect them before we put the glass back. And it was amazing what you could do because you'd get some snow on top of them but it wouldn't hurt things at all. Everything was happy underneath there. And uh, so this was the, the February 11th, and there were even the green tops being protected by the, uh, the straw mulch in there as we uh, uh, harvested uh, uh, carrots. And uh, these are lettuces. That's uh, the 28th of January that we put in the fall. They were wintering over very nicely. Uh, everything was looking good. We said, hey, we got a great system here. And in the summer, we can use this to grow melons and uh, other things, start them early, put them in after those early lettuces. This is fantastic. And then, of course, reality strikes. <laughs> and you realize why no one's been doing this up north. <laughs> but we were not to be daunted. So we put our frames inside hoop houses. And this was really the great leap forward. Uh, because here's it snowing like mad outside, but inside, it's absolutely delightful. Uh, that frame on the left in this picture, um, the tiny little rose there, I always wanted to plant seeds on the 1st of January. So it says 1 slash 1 on the stakes of those, and this picture was taken the 10th of February, and with no heat in there, and you can see the type of weather outdoors, things were up and growing, and we were harvesting all winter long. And we found out what we discovered was the two-layer system. And it turned out that each layer of protection we put up moved the protected area, one and one half USDA zones to the south. So outside where you see that cart, that is Maine. The first layer inside the greenhouse is New Jersey, which is a place you only want to go metaphorically, I can assure you. <laughs> and when I reached my hand under the glass into the cold frame, my hand was in Georgia. And this is in Maine for free. Two layers and all those crops were spending the winter in Zone 8 Georgia rather than Zone 5 Maine. And we had little thermometers in there that were proving this. We actually even for a while had these little computerized thermometers that told us exactly what was going on. When we decided we were going to do this commercially after playing with those ideas, we realized we needed something less expensive and easier to work with than the cold frames. So we started playing around with the uh, floating row covers, held up by a wire wicket over each bed, a wire wicket every four feet along the bed, just enough structure to hold the, the uh, fabric off the ground. And it, this was really the just amazing thing that you would walk in there, say you went in there at six in the morning after a night when it was 10 below, everything would be frozen solid. You couldn't even hardly lift that cover it was frozen solid would do, and when you did, you'd peek underneath and everything was frozen. You'd think this was ridiculous. But you'd come back about 10 o'clock after the sun, even the wan sun of a cloudy day had raised the temperature in there above freezing, and you lifted that cover up and it was perpetual spring. And this was the amazing thing. And for years, my children had to put up with this. I would come bouncing into the kitchen. I'd say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe. It's just amazing what's available out there. And they'd say, yeah, 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 shut up and make the vinaigrette. So anyway, um, 
we found out that this worked and so we said okay we're going to do this commercially and this is one of the charts we made from those computerized thermometers and the blue lines were how cold it was going outdoors and the uh, yellow lines are uh, that's how much warmer it was uh, uh, by having some protection uh, and when it was on the right hand side of that picture when it wasn't very cold out and it wasn't very warm during the day they were a lot closer together but it was amazing the uh, the difference we had when we started doing this everybody said well you can't possibly do it because there isn't going to be enough sun and so Barbara and I took a research trip in 1996 and we wanted to follow the 44th parallel of latitude where we are in Maine across Europe you guys are between right here in Danville between the 36th and 37th I think which puts you uh, somewhere in in North Africa uh, and everybody said oh my god you're gonna follow the 44th parallel across uh, uh, Europe in uh, in January boy there ought to be some great skiing in Oslo and we said no 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 Europe is so much further north on the planet than North America that the 44th parallel latitude that runs through Harborside Maine runs through the south of France and there are actually parts of Italy uh, actually a lot of Italy that's further north than we are as far as position on the planet so we went and dipped our toes in the uh, uh, Atlantic uh, somewhere south of Bordeaux where the we thought the 44th parallel across the beach and headed in and had a wonderful uh, tour across uh, visiting farmers and uh, just stopping whenever we saw a neat garden and talking to people and this is Italy this is actually uh, in Genoa uh, just uh, uh, north of the 44th parallel and this is in January and as you can see uh, they're not having any trouble at all in fact when we asked the European growers who are exactly in the same climate you're in their average January temperature was uh, uh, about 40 to 42 degrees uh, is there any trouble with Sun and they said Sun no we got plenty of Sun the problem is the cold so we thought that was pretty amusing we would told them they, they ain't seen nothing from cold yet so we figured hey we got it made the sun's on our side uh, and all we need to do is m make enough protection so that our plants think they're in Georgia rather than in Maine and so this is what it looks like in the greenhouse uh, with the covers out of the way and we wanted more though we said well you know if that greenhouse just sits there we're gonna have to plant these winter crops when it's pretty hot out in the summer and they're not going to be happy and we'd rather have crops that enjoy the protection where we are on the coast of Maine uh, uh, tomatoes do best if you have them in a greenhouse we'd like to leave the tomatoes in there longer what if we made the houses so they moved and then we could have a house full of tomatoes and on the plot next to it we could plant winter spinach or something and then by the time the tomatoes freeze out in there and the spinach needs protection we could move the house over and so voila it has moved from the uh, uh, tomatoes over to the spinach we're about to put in the inner layer because this took place sometime in early November and we're going to move on into winter this is basically what we were doing we had two plots for the greenhouse it was either on site A or site B and after a year on one site it went over to the other and this is an old European idea uh, I think the first record I have of a movable greenhouse is 1898 in England uh, but it had pretty much died out because all the major growers were, were sterilizing the soil in the greenhouse with chemicals in the old days people decided this was a good idea because after about 12 years in a greenhouse you end up having problems with uh, excess salts in the soil or maybe a buildup of pests and diseases and being able to move the greenhouse off and letting the sun wind and rain purify the soil was a great uh, improvement then we said well gee if we can move it twice we can move it three times and we set up other rotations that really uh, uh, made it as if the movable greenhouse now instead of are investing this capital in something that only grew so many crops we now found that with the best of these rotations we were getting 24 months of use out of the greenhouse every 12 months because the crop was only under there when it needed protection and then it would be moved over to a, another crop so this really became a passion and this was one of our first 
attempts at a, at a uh, semi-commercial uh, uh, movable greenhouse. Uh, the, one of the neighbors helping me uh, see whether this thing actually moved, and it did, and it moved very nicely. And that one, we, on the posts that you normally put in the ground to attach the greenhouse to, we put these large ball casters on the top of the posts and then had an angle iron on the bottom of the greenhouse. That was how that one moved. That was our first way of doing it. And then we said, what the heck, well, let's get simple. Let's put it right on the ground. And this was a, a greenhouse. The base of it was a, a, a cedar 4x4. Four four. And the problem with that, we realized after we made it, was that there was an awful lot of friction between that and the soil. We built these ski tips for the front of it so it would, uh, would move. And that one actually required a little more muscle to move. But that was a 30-foot wide by 100-foot house, so we were having fun. You can see how the ends fold up there. And then we said, OK, we're going to go with 50-foot houses, because these are going to be easier to move. This is a 22 by 50. And it just sat on a, a, a galvanized square pipe that sat on the ground. We had a blacksmith make those little brackets that hold the uh, hoops on there. And again, we had ski tips that we put on the front of this. And then, yeah, there's one of the uh, ski tips. Uh, there was a company in Canada that uh, makes oval hoops, and they actually made little brackets. We didn't have to go to the uh, uh, blacksmith for those. And so we were really having fun with these systems. And basically, we could get a crop of onions on the field while the house uh, uh, grew tomatoes in there. And then uh, after they were through, we plant our winter crops, which were very happy because they were out of doors and it wasn't excessively hot. And now it's fall, these are ready to need protection, and you just open the doors along the end of the greenhouse there, and you see me on my tractor in the background, and we had cables running straight down from the corners of this greenhouse down to the corners where it was going to go to through pulleys and then over to the tractor. So the pull was straight down the field. On the right-hand side of that picture, you see uh, a water spigot and uh, a post in the ground that uh, has uh, electricity in it. And that two feet strip right near the end of the greenhouse there is always inside the greenhouse. So when the greenhouse moves, as we're about to, it will stop just before it gets to that. And that's how you can have power and water in a movable greenhouse without having to move the power and water. You just change which end to the hoses you hook it up to. And it's just amazing if the thing is trundling down the field. You can see these from the road as you drive by our farm, and cars would always squeal to a halt because you don't often see something that big moving across the field. And after we moved the greenhouse for the next couple of days, I'd always do a double take because when you're used to seeing something that big there and it's suddenly over here, it is a, it is a new thing. If you move a greenhouse, you want to make sure that when it's in place, you chain it down. These are uh, four-ton ground anchors in there. If you can move it, the wind can. Something the, uh, the size of a small barn wafting toward you on a stiff breeze is <laughs> unnerving enough that you don't want to experience it. Um, the other thing we found was if you're going to do this, you get frozen ground in the winter, even down here. Um, and if you then get a rainstorm, it'll run right across the soil and through the greenhouse. So you want to have ditches around the area. You want to have a perched area for your winter greenhouse, and then you've got the drainage uh, uh, all set. And then we decided, well, we could make the houses move even easier. So we went and got the wheels that move gates in industrial parks. You've seen those gates and the chain link fences that go sideways, and they have little wheels on them that roll on a pipe. So we got those wheels, put the pipe on the ground, put a wheel on the bottom of each hoop, and this was a far simpler thing. All of a sudden, we didn't need a tractor. Two or three strong people with ropes could pull this greenhouse. The one new thing about it, though, all of a sudden, that greenhouse is sitting there like a, like a spider. Uh, that it isn't attached to the ground in any way. It's, and so if you want it to uh, have structure, you've got to put some diagonals up in the superstructure there to keep it from uh, racking either left or right. And uh, that was part of uh, what's going on there. And this was just a simple way to put some diagonal bracing up in there. And all of a sudden, we had a greenhouse that stood up nicely, and everything worked. 
and uh, the wheels roll beautifully on that pipe. Uh, the one disadvantage, of course, is that uh, you have a gap along the bottom of the house. We let the plastic head all the way down to the ground and just threw sandbags on it to uh, close up that gap. But you're always thinking of new ways of doing it. And, uh, well, we will get to that in a minute. Um, the other thing we thought about was, okay, a greenhouse. Okay, we're making this thing pay its way because we're using it. We're getting all that extra use out of it by making it movable. But do all the crops we're growing in there really need the protection of a greenhouse? So we figured, okay, maybe we could protect them with simpler structures. Uh, and you see those simpler structures next to it. We called these quick hoops. And first we were using 10-foot ten, ten lengths of uh, electrical conduit, half-inch electrical conduit made out of plastic that we just bowed into a hoop. And they covered two of our 30-inch beds. And then we uh, found a, uh, uh, a way to make a form that would allow us to bend uh, metal conduit, which was much stronger to make those. The nice thing about what you see there, those three uh, low hoops there, are covering the same amount of ground as that greenhouse, but for only 5% of the cost of the greenhouse. And down here in your milder climate, that might be all you need. The disadvantage is you can't walk in there, but it will give you a lot of nice, uh, nice protection. So then we came up with four move systems. And uh, uh, you could add in all sorts of crops. In fact, when we play with this, we were thinking, gee, you know, home gardeners could build a, a, a wonderful little greenhouse. And uh, uh, they could take crops that normally aren't hardy where they live and plant them and just make sure that the greenhouse was in position over that particular crop uh, during the coldest part of the winter. So for us, that would allow us up in Maine to grow figs, and we have done that uh, down here in the banana belt, maybe you don't have that problem, but uh, uh, it's definitely worth thinking about. We wanted a simpler way to anchor the, that five-move greenhouse because we we're moving it so often. So rather than those screw-in anchors, which would be permanently in the way, we anchored it with T-posts that we hammered in with a T-post pounder. And when it comes to time to pull them, we just pull them with a T-post puller. And this was a simpler way of anchoring and equally solid. And so there you have this greenhouse. We made bigger ends on it, so it was, uh, it was better uh, vented. And uh, uh, these were the, uh, uh, the quick hoops covered just at this point with uh, fabric. Uh, everybody usually calls it rime, it's a spun bonded fabric, floating row cover. And in the winter, we add uh, an extra layer of clear plastic over that uh, to make sure that it'll shed snow. But uh, this is a, a very simple way of uh, of protecting crops uh, uh, in a climate, uh, whoops, same slide as before, in climate less uh, uh, onerous than ours. We also experiment around with other designs for the end walls. Uh, this has two big vents. Uh, those are hinged with pins in the middle of them, like, uh, like butterfly vents. And the nice thing about that is you can rig those up with the automatic opening arm. This isn't <laughs> our farm. It hasn't really gotten that wintry. This is up in Colorado in my daughter's place. But uh, different venting, there's just, there's endless things that need to be experimented around with, uh, with uh, hoop houses uh, that could be so improved over what we're doing now. Um, there's now a company in Kansas that is making what I call the, the Cadillac of movable greenhouses. Uh, they make this V-track. And the V-track that you see there lays on the ground. And there are these wonderful wheels with bearings and uh, a grease fitting that roll on them, and these houses move so easily, two of us, just one on each corner, just walking along, pushing easily, can move a, 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 a 30 by 50 foot house uh, this way. This is a company uh, uh, called Four Season Tools. Uh, that uh, They're doing a wonderful job with that. Uh, their idea is that the V-track is anchored to the ground, and then the house is anchored to the V-track. And that's what you see here. Uh, those uh, cables with the cable tighteners are holding the house in place. And uh, thus far, it seems to have worked. Um, in case you were wondering, uh, 
about what I saw at Louis Savier's that so impressed me with all those cold frames. When we were there on our last trip uh, in 1996, Louis had retired, a lot of old growers like him had retired, and those beautiful cold frames we saw were now sitting on all these farms in piles that were composting, I would say, if you see this, and they had been replaced by the new technology of the 90s, where acre after acre of France looked like it was covered with snow, but it was covered with these low tunnels that the French call chenilles. Chenille is their word for caterpillar, and these things look like caterpillars all over the countryside. They were getting out of season production much more efficiently because these things were laid down by tractors like this. But the thing that fascinated me most of all was that the same systems that we'd seen before on Louis Savier's place, where you had crops interplanted with mosh, there were acres after acre of this uh, in these uh, areas in France. What makes it all work is compost. And I tell people this is probably the reason why there is so much resistance to organic agriculture, because this undermines huge industries. The idea that the world's best fertilizer is made for free in your backyard from waste products, I mean, this is the way life should be, this is the way Mother Nature designed it, but nobody wants you to know that. Everybody wants you to think that fertilizer is something you have to go out and buy. And the key to successful organic gardening and farming is just to collect as much organic matter as you can, make as much compost as you can, and spread it around. When my neighbors get bales rained on, they know I'll pay them baling costs and they deliver them. And we use them as the walls for large heaps like this. This is about 12 feet wide, 50 feet long. And we put everything in there uh, we can come up with. Uh, what looks black there is seaweed. We're close enough to the ocean that after storms we throw in seaweed. And all the wastes uh, from the vegetable operation go in there. If we uh, can mow an old hay field, you see a pile of hay at the end there. Uh, we sometimes will mow and rake up neighbors' hay fields if they don't have any use for it. That's organic matter. You layer that in there with everything else and you make all the compost you can. We turn it very simply. We scoop it up with the front loader, put it into a manure spreader and slowly inch it forward, making a nice windrow like that. If you put a couple of sheets of plywood on either side of the uh, uh, manure spreader, it makes a better windrow because it doesn't whip it out to the side. And we'll do that twice. We'll turn the compost twice. This isn't professionally made like the companies that have compost turners, but this is a very efficient way of making compost and we make as much as we possibly can. Where you saw those greenhouses with all those little rows side by side, uh, that wasn't done by elves, it was done by this wonderful little four row cedar, there's now a six row model, that I found in Europe years ago. I tell people I'm an odd tourist, I don't go to museums, I go to hardware stores. And that's how I find things like this. The seeds don't come up quite that quickly, but uh, it, does, it does put in rows uh, Two and a quarter inches apart, you get 12 rows on a 30-inch wide bed, and uh, it is a very accurate precision seeder. The reason that's important is once you have a greenhouse for end of season production, you have to stop thinking like a field grower. You have to start thinking like a greenhouse grower because you paid money for this, and you want to maximize yields. When we started, I asked European friends what spacing they used for carrots in the greenhouse, and they told me four square inches per carrot. Well, that cedar is putting carrots in in rows two inches apart. If the carrots are two inches apart in the row, you've got four square inches per carrot. You've got 12 rows of carrots on a 30-inch uh, bed. Uh, a field grower uh, at a conference I spoke at once asked me how I could possibly make a living on the small acreage I was farming. And uh, it, you know, he said he was farming 25 acres, and it was tough. And I said, well, how many rows of carrots do you get on a... 30 inch bed, and he said two. And I said, well, I'm getting 12, so you're gonna multiply my one acre by six. I said, how many crops a year are you getting? He said one, and I said, well, I'm getting four, so you're gonna multiply my six acres by four, I got 24 acres. And basically, you cannot believe 
if you work on intensive production, once you put up hoop houses, that's the, uh, the sort of uh, situation you're going to be in. I started designing tools years ago because I wanted better hoes, but I also wanted better techniques. Uh, the collineal hoe that is out there on the, uh, the Purple Mountain uh, uh, stand uh, was one of my first uh, experiments. This is what's called the wire weeder. This is wonderful for careful cultivation. But you'll notice this isn't for chopping. This is basically a razor. And you don't use it weed by weed, but you, I tell people, always cultivate, don't weed. Weeding is when there's a red root pigweed that's about six feet tall, staring you in the face, and you need an ax to get rid of it. Cultivating is when the weeds have just come up or barely come up and you shave them off the surface of the soil. And you do that as if I am a tractor and that is one of the cultivators. And I'm just walking along there, dragging that razor right across the surface of the soil. This is very quick, up and down the path, back and forth. You can cultivate in a greenhouse if you get the weeds when they're small extremely quickly with tools that are angled and designed for the job. This is one of our greenhouses. If you see that line on the left-hand side, that uh, happens to be uh, three feet of snow uh, against the back wall there. Um, the concrete floor in the foreground, when we built this greenhouse, we put pipes under there that we could put warm water through. And uh, we would start seedlings on there. Or in this case, you see there's a couple of beds there of basil. Um, the local chefs, have learned how to deal with me. They don't say, could you possibly grow me fresh basil for this special dinner I'm doing in mid-March? They say, boy, I bet you couldn't have basil ready in mid-March. <laughs> and I say, what do you mean I can't? Of course I can. And of course, then I, I lose a lot of money doing it. But it's fun to find out what you can and can't do. <laughs> and so you'll notice there's little wire wickets over those things. We put covers over them at night. And by golly, we had fresh basil for them when I promised it. But what you see out there is a quilt, and that's the wonderful thing, uh, because our main products were uh, baby leaf salads, and uh, we had this whole quilt of different ingredients. Some of them we would get two cuts off before we would quickly pull them and reseed them to something else. Uh, others we would get one cut, uh, but it was uh, just an amazingly productive system, and we had a lot of uh, uh, greenhouses doing this. Um, we uh, we grow uh, seedlings in there, like these leek seedlings uh, for putting out in the field. And if you want to grow nice leeks, the secret is either to hill them, which means you have to space them far apart. And we were learning that even what we were doing in the greenhouse was worth taking out to the field. So this dowel with a sharpened spatula tip uh, and that uh, guide on it, you can push that nine inches deep into the soil. And we would go and push that in every four inches along a row. And those leek seedlings I, were, I was cutting were 10 inches long. And you just drop them into the 9-inch deep hole. And you can get then three rows of leeks on a 30-inch bed. There's just an inch of leeks sticking out the top when you do it. You think this will never work. But what it gets you is leeks with a beautiful blanched shank on them like they're supposed to look. And that's the edible part because you've buried nine inches of them in the ground right from the start, and they grow there without any other uh, hilling or other problems. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the crops we grew, we had to hunt up. This is a uh, cut and come again uh, uh, frise endive from, uh, Ital uh, from Italy called Bianca Riccia d'Italio, which means white and curly by the leaf. And we sell a lot of stuff to uh, restaurants. And restaurants love featuring local produce, and they love neat names. And we figured Bianca Riccia d'Italio might be a little too much name. So we renamed it. We called it Golden Frise. They loved it. We, we doubled sales by changing the name of the crop. <laughs> we did the same with, uh, with baby Swiss chard. Uh, we, always thought people didn't want the stems, and so we started cutting Swiss chard uh, about the size of your hand. And it was so tender then, we renamed it butter chard. And within 
two weeks, uh, all 15 of the restaurants we were selling to had a butter charred salad on their menu. So it shows what you can do with a little uh, marketing. Uh, we learned from a friend in, in uh, Europe who found that if he took his celeriac, those turnip rooted celery that look so ugly and are, uh, you can't imagine by buying them, and uh, put them up in the greenhouse for a week before he sold them so they grew a little green top that they sold three times as well. So we found with something like these kohlrabis, when we harvested them, we would leave that little green top on there and people thought they were much cuter and, and bought more of them. This is, the, uh, this is the chard that became butter chard. It's regular old Ford hook chard. And in the background there, you see some onions. We are probably slightly devious, so if there's anybody here from Georgia, don't arrest us, but we heard about these Vidalia onions and we researched them and found out that basically they were just Texas granos that had been planted back in December, but in the particular section of Georgia. So we got a hold of the, of the plant people in Texas who raised those and we bought a bunch of them and we put them in. And lo and behold, we had these beautiful big sweet onions around the 10th of May. And we looked up on the web and the people in Vidalia were just starting to sell their harvest. This is pretty good for Maine. It shows you can do anything with it little bit of greenhouse. So we were slightly honest. You know, you can't call it champagne. You have to call it uh, method champenoise. So these were, uh, uh, our onions were method videlianoise. <laughs> um, there's an enormous market for watercress, but people are always a little nervous. They're wondering about what sort of stream the watercress grew in. Well, we found that we could grow unbelievably beautiful watercress in the greenhouse by just putting misters over it. We put it on that uh, floor that we could put a little winter bottom heat to it, put these misters that put out a gallon an hour, and uh, found that uh, it was possible to grow some of the nicest watercress you'd ever want to see as a winter crop. I always mention this to people who have uh, greenhouses that they use for bedding plants in the spring, and they're wondering what to do with them in the middle of the winter. You could put uh, flats on there, grow a watercress very easily and, uh, and find it was a, a wonderful midwinter addition to your cropping program. We always grow a lot of fall carrots and uh, uh, plant them around the 1st of August uh, where we are between the 1st and the, and the 10th. And we leave them in the cool soil and it's just amazing how that uh, makes for a nice sweet carrot. And one year we had a whole field we'd grown for a customer who decided they didn't need them. And so we were sitting there looking at all of these carrots and we decided, okay, marketing is the key. And this says on there, if you can read it, it says Thanksgiving gift pack. Well, what the hell? No one had ever given gifts for Thanksgiving before, but we invented <laughs> the Thanksgiving gift pack. And we sold four times as many onions right before Thanksgiving by packaging them up like this as we ever had before. So it shows over the river and through the woods and you took grandma a gift this time, which was nice of you. <laughs> we wanted to see what we could do in the unheated greenhouse with uh, uh, stir fry crops. And that's a pink shunkyu radish, a, uh, uh, a carrot, a hakurai turnip, a leek, a uh, tatsoi and a pak choy in there. And this was our stir-fry pack. Everything you needed for a stir-fry, these are all hardy crops uh, produced easily in the, in the winter. And uh, that was an uh, enormously good seller. This was our major crop. This was our baby leaf salad. And there's bull's blood uh, beet in there, that nice red leaf. There's baby spinach. There's the Bianca Risha. Uh, there's a bunch of lettuces, uh, those little uh, uh, spade-shaped uh, leaf on the left there. That's a Claytonia, a wonderful hardy crop from California. And this is really a, a, our signature crop. Um, radishes, we can grow fantastic radishes. Uh, in the middle of winter, we can't do them in the unheated houses, but you could down here. Um, and when we got into marketing produce, we decided that uh, we didn't want to be wasteful. And we'd read that 25% uh, of the volume in local landfills is from food packaging waste. So we made our own boxes out of cedar that we cut uh, on the farm and had a neighbor mill for us. Uh, got a branding iron and put a brand name in there. And this was a beautiful uh, way to take our produce to the stores and it looked nice in the stores. These are our August 
planted carrots. We learned to harvest them, since they were freshly dug, with an inch of green top on them, which advertised that they were freshly dug. And these things have become so popular that uh, uh, parents in neighboring towns have told us that these are the trading item of choice in local grade school lunch boxes. Uh, they are a sweet carrot because they sit in the cool soil, and it's wonderful when you, you really feel good when you get, find out that little kids are eating vegetables thanks to your effort. This is our farm stand. Barbara put those absolutely beautiful beds in the front of it of uh, different uh, uh, perennial flowers, and it's filled with uh, everything we, we grow. Uh, we, the only thing we've ever sold that we don't grow are some blueberries from a neighbor right down the road. Uh, that seemed like a fair thing, but everything else in here, we grow some 35 different crops. There's even our peaches uh, there in the front. And uh, we try and make sure that the quality is as exceptional as it can possibly be. Uh, we go to farmers markets and we wanted to have a way to be efficient about it. So we built on a five by eight trailer frame what we call the veggie wagon. And you can load up to 2,000 bucks worth of produce inside that. These shelves fold up and make the walls. The uh, awnings are roll up and, and the pipes come out and everything's inside. And this has been wonderful because we can take this anywhere that we decide there should be a farmer's market. We can go to any underserved area. Uh, we advertise in the paper where, where we're going to be which day, and this has just been an unbelievably uh, successful thing. It's totally self-contained. The uh, cash register on the back uh, left there, there's an a, a electric uh, cable coming from the towing vehicle that uh, run off the battery. And uh, this is, anyway, people have found it cute and uh, it's, it's had a great response. And that's the two people who are foolish enough to do this in their, in their snazzy dress. Um, if you don't enjoy frozen hands, uh, wet feet, <laughs> snow down the back of your neck occasionally, you can probably find other work. But uh, if, you, if you dress for it <laughs> and don't worry about your sense of style, it, uh, it's a great thing to do. And this is the sign at the end of our farm, real farming, real food. Uh, that's the way we feel about it and we go out of our way to make sure that the key to our organic farming isn't just the sins we're not committing by not spreading uh, pesticides and chemicals around, but the good things we are doing by focusing on taking as exceptional care of the soil, making sure it has every trace of mineral it can have, plenty of organic matter, it's well aerated and the crops are well irrigated in order to turn out the finest produce we can final, possibly turn out. And I have some other pictures that I was going to bring up if people had questions about specific things because some of these pictures uh, deal with those specific things. Uh, but I would like to take questions and if one of the techies can come up and get me these other things on the screen, that would be great. So we can have the lights momentarily and, and questions. Yeah. Oh, I, I wanted to say one other thing. Um, on the way down here, Barbara and I purposely flew into uh, uh, DC so we could drive down to Southern Maryland uh, is that the, uh, Which one do you the, the one that says third on there? I mean, she put it on the bottom. So we could drive down to southern uh, Maryland and visit with a wonderful farmer there called Brett Grosgall. And Brett is doing what we're doing in Maryland, but he's doing it without greenhouses. And I thought I wanted to see him since I was coming down here because what he's doing would really be even more appropriate here or in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, he's determined that, that by breeding and selecting for hardy survivors of all the winter crops he wants to grow, that he can grow out of doors. And he was. And we wandered around with him and it was amazing how the taste of many of these cool weather crops just changes and improves fantastically. And it was, it was neat to see someone approaching it. Uh, I've been passionate about greenhouses. Uh, Brett was approaching it by being passionate about plant breeding and, uh, and working with plants. 
there are all sorts of different answers to the idea of how we're going to get fresh food in the winter. And uh, that's another uh, option that you should look into. Uh, Brett's place is called Even Star Farm, and uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange out there sells some of the varieties that he has bred. And uh, you can go on the web and look up uh, Even Star Farm and, uh, and learn more about it. But uh, that was, I think, a, a great uh, uh, a possibility for, uh, for down here. So who might have had a question about some of the things we were doing? Yeah. Uh, do we add anything else to our soil beside compost? Uh, in the greenhouse, we uh, are very fond of alfalfa meal. Uh, we refer to it as a low-test fertilizer. The, the greenhouse is a very concentrated uh, uh, environment, and you can get in trouble in there with a pushy organic fertilizer like dried blood or something like that. It's going to be just a little too much because all the conditions are uh, intensified in there. Alfalfa meal has turned out to be, on, on where we're following a crop like spinach or claytonia that takes a lot out of the soil and you want a little bit of extra nitrogen kick, uh, alfalfa meal is perfect beside the fact that being deep rooted, it's got all those minerals in it, it's a wonderful crop. Uh, we can also get a crab meal, uh, a, a fertilizer made from old uh, crab and lobster wastes from a plant up in New Brunswick, Canada that we will use also, but we mainly use that in the field. Uh, but that and, and compost, uh, that's basically what we use. Yes? What do we find necessary for pest management? That's always the hardest crop, excuse me, hardest question to answer. Um, when I first got involved in this game years ago, I got into farming from being an adventurer. I was a rock climber, among other things, and therefore I loved the impossible. And I read books about organic farming, and it said that if you grew plants correctly, that you wouldn't have pest and disease problems. And I loved it because any time I asked anybody about that, they said, yeah, but that's impossible. I said, oh, good, I'm going to do it. Um, basically, what that literature says is true. And I have written papers, which I've had published in many places, with bibliographies from all the best entomological journals. And the bibliographies follow the line of studies that have been done on plant stress. And they show that when plants are under stress, there's a change in their internal composition that makes them susceptible to pests and diseases. When they aren't under stress, Pests and diseases don't stand a chance. We grow 35 different crops, both in winter and summer, and we use no pest control because basically we have no pests. And we've had them. And there have been experiences that just point this out. And just last summer, I was harvesting uh, carrots from a bed, and I'm working along that most beautiful carrots I'm pulling out, and all of a sudden I'm pulling out carrots with root maggot in them. And I thought, golly, oh, that's odd, and I'm throwing them aside, and this is going on for about six feet of the bed, and then all of a sudden the carrots are beautiful again. Now, for people who say, oh, you know, you're too far from the pest, no. There were some carrots there with root maggot right next to them, but there were some without it. And I thought, wow, what happened here? And I realized that the previous fall, uh, I'd been taking my uh, uh, chisel plow through there, and I'd hit a big rock. And I'd taken it out, and I'd obviously mix it, mix, mixed in so much subsoil that the soil was not up to par there. But this was just so clear. I'm going along, suddenly there's six feet of carrots uh, with uh, uh, root maggots and then uh, none at all again. And it's just, it's dependent on whether the plants are getting from the soil what they need. And I can't tell you the number of times I've wondered why in our 40 years on our farm, no one from the University of Maine has ever come down to see what's going on. We don't hide anything. And if this is impossible, I'm just eager for someone to come down and show me how it is impossible, because we're doing it year after year on a daily basis. And we can do it because we focus so much on creating optimal soil. And optimal soil has all the organic matter you can possibly 
uh, get in there. And if you want a good trick at the start when you're, when you're just beginning, uh, put on two inches of peat moss. Especially in the greenhouses where you really have an intense environment, that will transfer even a clay soil just unbelievably because the beauty of peat moss is it's structural organic matter. There isn't any food value in there. Then you, cause you, so you put on you know, two inches of manure, you're going to probably have a, a, a indigestion of the soil. The peat moss will give you structure, then you can put on the amount of compost and, and uh, alfalfa meal, whatever you want to use on, on top of that. Uh, but you have to create soil conditions that favor vegetables. And vegetables grow well in exceptional soil conditions. Uh, when I was researching those gardens in, in uh, Paris in the uh, 1850 to 1900 period, I found a book by one of the Parisian growers. And I quote it in the uh, uh, Winter Harvest Handbook. Because he says in the book, uh, you don't see pest problems on Parisian market gardens where gardeners are using plenty of compost and a good crop rotation. This book was written in 1857. What is he saying this? He didn't even heard about organic agriculture. He'd never heard about pesticides. He just said, you don't have... To. This is a man writing about the reality of his daily life as a market gardener in Paris in the 1850s. So I'm not telling you anything that's a miracle. I'm just telling you that this idea fascinated me so much that we worked hard on it. And that is the reality of our experience with pests. The two hardest to deal with for us were the Colorado potato beetle and the uh, white butterflies that lay the green worms on the broccoli. And it wasn't until, I would say, six, eight years ago that we finally got the, all the soil to the point that there's no green worms on the broccoli. We see the butterflies all the time fluttering around. And if you read the literature, they can't nourish themselves on a plant that's put together correctly. And so they can lay the eggs on them, but the insects can't grow. And it, it, you know, if, if you doubt that, just go to the entomological literature. Uh, it, it's all there. And why is nobody paying attention to this? The same reason they don't pay attention to all the uh, ideas about human health. There's no money in correcting the cause of the problem. There's only money to be made in treating the symptom. Pests are a symptom of poor soil. And this isn't, no one's being mean about this. There's just no business to be made. You can't start a business doing nothing. I've been in this game for 40 years and I could not start a business tomorrow to become the Monsanto of organic farming. Because the first thing I would tell my prospective customers is, great news guys, there's nothing to buy. What sort of business is that? I said, hey, if you make compost, that's free. You know, if you uh, aerate the soil, that's free. If you run a crop rotation, hey, you don't have to buy a crop rotation. You don't have to, I mean, all of those systems are there. They have been there as long as agriculture has been productive. And if they don't work, how was humanity being fed for the last 10,000 years? And you can read about crop rotation I have a book on Roman farming. They knew everything we knew. They talk about crop rotation and green manures and cover crops and all of this stuff, compost making. It's just that once there was a product to sell, once there was a chance to convince people that the old systems were inadequate and you needed to buy the numerical product, that was when it all started. But the beauty of organic farming is it's proving that uh, the numerical products are unnecessary. Sorry for the long lecture, but that is a question I get asked a lot. Yeah, way back there. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Uh, now another embarrassing question. My cover cropping schemes. <laughs> um, the soil on which we started had three inches of topsoil and more rocks than the, than the mountains. And it's taken 40 years to get an acre and a half of that to the point that it'll grow exceptional uh, vegetables. And so as we have intensified our production, we're growing later into the fall and earlier in the spring, we actually have found that there's no room for green manure cover crops in our scheme any longer. And I've been talking to a number of people about this because I'm really curious to do a study. Let's say I could put in a green manure on the 1st of September. But on the 1st of September, instead, I put in a late uh, cabbage crop. 
that I'm not going to harvest until mid-November. And so in mid-November, I have something to sell, whereas with the green manure, I wouldn't have. And since it's cabbage, I've sold the heads, but all the outer leaves, the stem, and the roots are still there to add to the soil. And it's probably interesting to, to calculate whether I've added as much organic matter to the soil with the residues of my late cabbage crop as I would have with uh, a green manure that I grew. And the green manure would have given me a problem the following spring because we try and plant everything as early as possible. And if you turn under a green manure, you really should wait three weeks for the soil to digest it before you plant anything. And so that would slow us down in the spring. So that's what's happened with that, that we are uh, cropping so early and so late that there's none of that left in our system. Am I recommending that to all of you? No, I think green manures and cover crops are wonderful but they're just not part of our system at the moment. Yes? Excuse me? Oh, I see. Yeah, the, the question is about the residue after I cut off the head of that late cabbage. Uh, you have the outer leaves, you have the stem, you have the roots in the ground, and we just come through the rototiller and put that right in the ground. So that's our late green manure, so to speak. And uh, it, we're, we're putting a lot of, uh, of stuff into the, into the soil, so uh, it probably isn't that bad. I was just going to talk about tools quickly. Um, let's see. Can we? Nope, I got to do something else here. Let's see. Uh, does that come up? Yeah, yeah. Um, chisel plow. We do have a chisel plow on the farm. And uh, we think this is a wonderful tool. If you have soil compaction, that's one of the things you want to get rid of. In the greenhouse, we'll use the broad fork. This is one wider uh, than the one that Purple Mountain is selling out there because this is designed for 30-inch beds and it goes down the bed. We, we think that's a great uh, uh, tool in the greenhouse for loosening soil. Um, we. Uh, used to uh, uh, mix fertilizers and stuff in with this three-time cultivator. This was the least popular job on the farm. The person doing it was snidely referred to as the human rototiller, which was not a... So I said, okay, we can do better than that. And I found a guy who was out of work robotics engineer, and I made a suggestion that we could come up with a tool that would do that better. And this is called the Tilther. It's in the Johnny's catalog. And I realized that Mr. DeWalt was a lot smarter than I am. And uh, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to make this work. Um, there, yeah. And uh, so it's designed so you put your cordless drill on there. And if it's an 18 volt, you really have a lot of power. This will do about one-third of a 100-foot greenhouse with one battery charge. And we have the modern uh, rope around the trigger up the handle to uh, make it work. But this has been a great tool, and it has an advantage. If you ever used a small rototiller, they have that gearbox in the center. And so we made this like a tractor model. The uh, tines on this are on a shaft all the way across, and then on the left-hand side there, uh, there's uh, a couple of gear wheels and, uh, and a chain coming up, and uh, so yeah, you have no uh, gearbox gap. This was a wonderful tool in the uh, greenhouse, and we're actually, I got a couple of people working to uh, uh, put a, a little electric motor there and, uh, and a battery to uh, uh, make it uh, uh, more effective out in the field. Um, in the greenhouse, we... Uh, we smooth things out with a 30-inch rake, and we found in the greenhouse that we leave the compost on the surface. Uh, we don't uh, till it in. We spread it and then just work into the top half inch with the, with the rake, and the next time when we repair the, re prepare the bed, it gets tilted in when we put in the alfalfa meal or something. That's been a, 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 very, a very successful uh, uh, system, putting it on the surface. In case you were wondering about that little Cedar, it, uh, it has different shafts and the, uh, 
uh, shafts have little holes in them. That's what uh, the seeds are falling into. There's now a, a, a six-row model uh, that uh, uh, it, you only need one pass down the bed with that. We do a lot with um, soil blocks. I'm very fond of them. This is how we raise all our seedlings. So at the end of the season, there are no wiggly plastic flats uh, lying around blowing in the wind. Uh, everything is it's been put in the soil. And when you uh, start seeds in that tiny little uh, uh, blocker there, uh, you can start an awful lot of seeds on a heat pad, and then they are the exact same size as the cubic pins in that big blocker on the left, and that gives you blocks with a square cubic hole in them into which you drop the little uh, seedling when you want to pot it onto a bigger spacing. That has been uh, an amazingly successful system. And then you have uh, uh, you know, just beds of these uh, lying around waiting to go into the ground. Uh, I'm just uh, particularly fond of seed uh, systems with no, uh, with no, no waste. And uh, it's just a, a neat way of doing it. Uh, we also use that rake with little uh, uh, fingers on it to mark out beds go down the bed and then go across and every place is an X use where you want to put your plants in. This is quick and efficient and a nice, a nice trick. Um, we modified uh, bricklayer trowels to use as, uh, as transplanting tools. And if you look at it here, you'll see that with the regular trowel on the left there, you're getting a lot of wrist deviation, which is hard on you if you choose a stab trowel like that, uh, there's no uh, there's no stress on your on your wrist. We modified one of those single flamers you see out there at one of the booths by uh, having it go into a cover with a roller, and we're looking to improve this uh, because the amount of propane that's burning is far in excess of what's needed. But we use propane pre-emergence weeding, which is what this is there for, uh, to grow crops like, uh, like you saw earlier, uh, the way we can, uh, can have 12 rows of the bed of carrots like that, is that uh, you prepare the bed a week before you plant the carrots, you plant the carrots and you wait a week just before they come up, and you go over the surface with the pre-emergence flame, flame off the weeds, the carrots come up into a weed-free seabed, and uh, Bingo, you're off and running. When we design tools, your standard hoe is on the right there, the collineal hoe, the first, my first tool design is on the left. And the beauty of it is that you're standing, using it in an upright position because of that 70 degree angle between the blade and the handle. And it makes it uh, a much more uh, uh, comfortable tool to use. You use it uh, to shave the surface of the soil like uh, the, uh, ones I, that one I showed earlier. This is a tool in the Johnny's catalog if you're harvesting baby leaf salad. Um, it has a, a very sharp uh, uh, meat blade on the front and you just saw it back and forth as you go and the, the leaves collect into the bin there. Um, I wish it were as easy as it looks in the picture. This is an athletic event and uh, you have to have good balance and, and, and uh, a strong back to use it, but it, compared to harvesting uh, plant by plant with a knife, it is, uh, it is, a, good, uh, it is a good system. Uh, anyway, just wanted to show a few of those tool slides. So we can have the lights off again and, and, and we'll go back to more, more questions. Yeah. Yes, there are, are uh, formulas uh, in the new organic grower uh, for the soil block mixes we used to use. And uh, for years, I made my own and uh, didn't think any, anybody out there making a commercial mix had anything worth even playing with. Um, but a good friend who's an excellent composter, Carl Hammer, who, who runs Vermont Compost Company, once sent me a bag and said, damn it, try this, and I did. And it was as good as mine. So I patted him on the back and I now buy from Carl. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the 
guys out there in Purple Mountain, I believe, are selling uh, uh, his Fort 5 mix, which is, just makes exceptional blocks. It's really a good, uh, a good system. Yes? Challenges for seed germination. Uh, we try and provide them the best conditions we can possibly provide them. So we have heat mats underneath them uh, to keep the usually 70 degrees for most seeds, your warm weather seeds, uh, like uh, uh, cucumbers and melons, we germinate with 85 degree bottom temperature. Uh, we keep them moist, we mist them. Uh, if you're really concerned, and this is really interesting, in nature, the seeds germinating find cooler temperatures at night and then warmer temperatures during the day when the sun's out. And studies have been done where actually if you set it up like that, uh, that does improve germination because somehow that uh, variation is, is beneficial to germinating seeds. We buy new seeds pretty much every year. Uh, uh, someone was asking about that uh, uh, recently and I said uh, cheap seeds are one of the most expensive things you can buy because uh, uh, especially if you're waiting and waiting and then they don't come up, you've blown a week or, or something and you're behind. So it's really worth trying to guarantee that you have good seed. And uh, that means you go to a reputable uh, seed house like uh, Southern Exposure out there. Those guys are doing a great job. They're down in your area. Uh, I would recommend uh, that you spend good money on seeds. Yes, sir? Okay, the, the question is about alfalfa meal and solarization. The reason I first got interested in alfalfa meal was that I didn't want to get hooked on a fertilizer that I couldn't make myself if I needed to. And uh, we haven't yet, but it is getting more expensive. And uh, uh, so I'm always looking for uh, something. And actually recently, when we ran out of alfalfa meal, we used the crab meal which I can get for 300 a ton from Canada, which is a dang good price, uh, on a lighter application and wonder if we might just use that instead. Uh, but the nice thing about alfalfa meal, it is something you could make yourself and it does w work well in the, in the tunnel. The second question is about solarization. And you guys are down here where you have a lot more heat than, than we do. As you can see, uh, the only way I can get uh, tomatoes to market early is to keep them in the greenhouse. The same goes for cucumbers and everything. That isn't a problem uh, you have. You have a problem with it overheating in the summer. And the question is, do you get a reflective 30-40% uh, shade cloth and put it over it to try and keep it cooler in there? Uh, or do you uh, put, irrigate it, put plastic on the soil, shut it up completely, and use it to solarize the soil. Solarize the soil meaning using the heat of the, of the sun uh, during the hottest part of the summer to heat the soil to a temperature where you will uh, kill disease spores and, and kill weed seeds. Um, that has been used successfully in places. We can't do it up. We just don't get enough sun to even begin to uh, make a difference. I mean, I might be able to hit 120, but I can't hit a a temperature hotter than that, so I can't tell you from my experience whether it works or not. But it seems like a reasonable solution, and especially with a movable greenhouse, you could probably move it along and do three areas in the course of the hot period. Is that the uh, techie still here? Yeah. If you could bring up one more uh, of those things in there. There was, uh, I just wanted to not miss this. We can find those. There was one uh, uh, right here, that one. Mobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And put it on slide sh slideshow. Yeah. I didn't want to forget to show you this. Um, we use greenhouses for everything. And the nice thing about a greenhouse is this is a $2 a square foot building. And so this is a 22 by 48 foot greenhouse. And this is our new movable chicken house. And we wanted a, a way to have the chickens get new soil all winter long. And uh, so we built this. There's uh, 
uh, mesh, uh, inch by inch uh, metal mesh uh, all over the wall. And uh, the plastic at the bottom there could be removed in the summer if we wanted the end to that to open up. But inside, uh, there are these $10 wheels, they're inflated wheels from Northern Tools under every other hoop. And there's a, a, a solid bar along the bottom that the hoop sit on. Uh, all the feeders are hanging and uh, uh, the, there's a community laying box on the side there. And the chickens roost on the roosting bars in the back end of the house, the back 10 feet. And we move this 10 feet every week all winter, so it's a cheap way to clean out the chicken house. I'm not shoveling any chicken manure. I'm not spreading any chicken manure. When it gets down to the end of the field, which is 30 two weeks away from where it started, I till up the field and I grow field corn on it in the summer on the manure the chickens spread for me. But the reason I'm showing these pictures is one of the best ways to make a greenhouse movable is to put it on wheels like this. And there you can get a better view of the, of the wheels. Um, there is an axle sticking out uh, through the, uh, the uh, metal a pipe at the bottom that the wheel is on. And for this greenhouse, since it's moving in the winter and we have a lot of snow outside right now, we put the wheels on the inside. But normally, if you put those on the outside, you can set the house down on the ground and then there's not that gap that I mentioned before when it's in place. And then just come along, jack the greenhouse up, slide the wheels on, move it, and put the greenhouse back down. The system I showed you with the uh, uh, wheels rolling on the pipe is a wonderful system, but those wheels are sitting there under the greenhouse doing nothing. And if you have six greenhouses, that's a lot of wheels sitting there doing nothing. With these things, you jack the greenhouse up, put the wheels on, move the greenhouse, set it back down on the ground, and you have one set of wheels. And these are $10 a piece wheels instead of $25 a piece wheels that will uh, uh, move the, uh, all the greenhouses you have. Uh, we've just been using this uh, this year on this uh, chicken house, but uh, it definitely is, uh, is something I recommend. I just wanted to not uh, remember to, to mention that. Uh, it's the simplest, least expensive way to, to move a greenhouse that I know, and they move very easily if you do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I don't know if you can see it in that picture, but the bottom two feet Inside, we put aluminum window screen on and the plastic is over it. We did that because the chickens will peck through plastic if they can. So there's window screen at the bottom two feet to keep them from doing that. It goes down to the ground. And basically, there's such a small gap here that the only thing that could get in there is a weasel. And we, the, up where we live in the winter, the weasels turn white and they become ermines. And uh, Barbara has seen our resident uh, ermine scurrying by in front of the house a couple of times with a vole in its mouth. And I immediately researched it and found out they have to eat a vole a day instead of, in order to make it through the winter. And I thought this was the best thing I'd ever heard of. Um, <laughs> but it's only about 100 yards over to the chicken house. And the, the ermine or weasel hasn't gone there yet. When it does, I will probably uh, do something about it. But at the moment, I'm just delighted that it's out there doing in our, our vol problem. So this is sort of a wonderful balance between, uh, but yeah, a, a, a weasel or a mink could get in there, but a, a fox or something couldn't get under, especially now when the ground is so frozen. It's only about a two inch gap along the, the bottom. Yes? Yeah, we, the 30 inch beds have a one foot path in between them. And when we have a freshly tilled area, we'll go along with a shovel and just throw a little soil up in the bed before we rake it smooth. I'm too scotched to waste the soil that I'm gonna walk on. But basically we have trodden paths rather than raised beds. And our experience has been that we want the depth down in the soil because a raised bed can be up where it's drying out uh, too quickly or it's getting colder because it's, it's more exposed to, and especially for winter growing, you want to have all your depth down where the uh, soil is your heat storage plenum. And that makes a big difference. Yes? 
Excuse me? Uh, did we weld the axle to the hooks? We, we drilled a hole through, and it is a bolt with, uh, with a nut on the inside, and then a washer, and then the wheel. If we were doing this for a, a plant greenhouse, that axle would be on the outside to just reverse what you can see here. Yes? Yeah, the, the, do we do soil tests and what about the compost, uh, phosphorus levels? Um, probably once every five years I'll do a soil test. And every time it comes back, everything is off the scale to the right, every single nutrient. And uh, uh, after all these years, the uh, organic matter level in some of our greenhouses is between 15 to 18 percent, which is probably why they're, they're working so well. Um, I happen to think that the soil tests that are being used today can't deal with high organic matter in the soil, which is why everything comes back off the scale. And I say that as a non-scientist, but there, there has to be a way to come up with a better test for people who are keeping up the organic matter level in the soil. Now phosphorus is a very interesting question, and I am slowly coming to the conclusion that the one way the organic people went wrong at the start years ago, when they were trying to model the system on chemical agriculture, the NPK system, is that they figured they had to duplicate what was being suggested out there. And what's being suggested with, uh, with P is putting a lot in, because what you're putting in is, is uh, monocalcium phosphate and it's immediately turned into tricalcium phosphate in the soil and, and tied up. What we are doing when we put in phosphate rock, figuring we're going to put in the tied up stuff and create conditions that make it available with plenty of organic matter. And that's what we're doing and I really question whether we need as much phosphorus as we think we would if we're looking at the NPK thinking. And so I am using hardly any phosphate rock these days, and every time a soil comes back, those readings are still off the chart to the right. So whether there is science behind this or not, that's just a hunch I have. And the hunch came from the fact that years ago, when, when I was first reading about organic agriculture, and they're telling you where all the nutrients are going to come from, they said, oh yeah, well, manure can get you nitrogen, and legumes can get you nitrogen, and manures can get you potassium, uh, and so forth. But gee, there's, you know, there's no plant wastes that will give you any phosphorus. So you've got to go bring in phosphate rock. And I remember thinking to myself, gee, I wonder if Mother Nature knows something. If there's no excess phosphorus out there and all these plant wastes, so maybe we're using too much of it. And that thought has stuck with me, and I continue to wonder about that. Don't change your farming practices because of my question, but I have been changing mine. Yes, one last question, then I think we've got to go. Excuse me? Oh, yes. Um, Back, yeah, let's see if we can go backwards here. The question was, what keeps the chicken house anchored? Um, we drove uh, T-posts in every 20 feet. Uh, the right-hand side of it there is next to a fence where there already are T-posts. And in this picture, you notice, we, when we were just building, we had a rope there. We realized quickly that we didn't want a rope in the middle of the winter because it gets wet and freezes up and you wouldn't be able to undo it when you move the house. So we now have a chain uh, attached to the base of the T-post and coming over to an uh, uh, eye on the greenhouse at each corner. And we have a, a chain tightener on each one of those. And it's very quick and easy to move. In fact, this house moves so easily that I don't need any help. I can do it myself. I just unhook the thing. Uh, what do I have to do? I have to uh, take the, the walkways uh, for the uh, laying box off and uh, unplug the uh, heater for the uh, uh, water, and then I just look at the tractor and move it 10 feet. It, in fact, the first five times I moved it, I was kept wondering when the other shoe was going to drop because, by golly, this was easy. 
Very rarely do my new crazy ideas work out as <laughs> easily as this one did. And so there is a T-post like that every 20 feet along either side of it. And that's what it's anchored to. And that seems to be very successful. The reason we did that is because that's something you could do in any field, just driving in a T-post every 20 feet on either side. Uh, we can probably take one last question before everybody leaves. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, mainly we're using it on uh, the lettuce and arugula that goes into our baby leaf mix. Some of the other crops, like the Bianca Risha, it doesn't do as well on. The bull's blood beet, you're better off cutting by hand. I'm working with students in two different engineering schools to try and come up with one that is a stainless steel box about 16 inches wide with a cutter bar on the front run by a little electric motor. And so you just slide it and scoop. And I've been working on this, unfortunately, for 12 years, and we haven't got it yet. But when we get it, because if you realize that when you're cutting baby leaf with your knife, you're competing against five foot wide machines on laser level fields in California with a bandsaw blade on the front and a belt taking it up and it's dropping into tubs, this is an unequal competition, and we have to do something about that. And we are going to, and we are going to win. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.